Uh, my guest today has been an actor and performer for over 35 years. You've seen him in movies and TV series such as Sex, Lies, and Murder, Freddy vs. Jason, and Carrie, to name a few. He's author of the number one best-selling book, The Power to Speak Naked. And ladies and gentlemen, we're getting one-on-one with him right now. Tyler Foley is here. Oh, Finch. That's probably the best intro I've ever gotten. I appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. Hey, man. It's such a pleasure to have you here on the fence. Now, you're on the fence, and you're going to help us get people off the fence, but maybe during the show, we could get your ass off the fence on something, huh? <laughs> That'd be good, yeah. <laughs> now, I read that it said you are funny as fuck, okay? And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bring it. It's a challenge at that point, right? Tyler funny is funny. funny. Yeah, let's see who's funny today. Uh, and I, I kind of got that vibe, man. I was like, yeah, if he's funny as fuck, we're going to have a really great time. Well, I, I hope to bring, I hope to live up to the challenge. That's the thing because nothing, nothing sucks worse when you're five foot eight like I am than to not, <laughs> not live up to a challenge, right? Because I got to let that short man syndrome come forward. You know? Oh, man. The days of five foot eight. I remember those days, Tyler. <laughs> yeah, I remember when you were eight too. <laughs> okay, so you have this phenomenal book, and yeah. my team was like, uh, man, especially my assistant, she was like, hey, can we get a copy of that book? Because I want to read that. I think she just want to walk around naked. I don't know what it is. But yeah. she's <laughs> she talking about how you speak naked, the power to speak naked. Let's talk a little bit about that and how that came about. Well, so, I mean, it. It's it's a multi-layered, it's a very complex title that takes in many. No, I'm kidding, man. I I, I came up with that uh, spitballing with a couple of friends one day. Um, I was, as I tend to do, going off the handle on absolutely nothing. I think somebody had been asking me some advice on how to public speak, and and somebody said, "Well, you know, picture the audience naked the, when we're having this little powwow." And I went, "That is the worst advice you could give <laughs> anybody." And they're like, why? I'm like, you know, the, the whole idea behind that is to find comfort in other people's discomfort. And all you're going to do is feel awkward. And you're going to be standing there looking at people going. <laughs> and, and they're going to look at you like, and you're going to look at them like, and then it's no good. So no, it's, it's bad advice. And I, I had said to them, I'm like, what I would be really good is if I could get you to the point where you could stand up and speak naked. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, if I could give you the power to speak naked. And as soon as I said it, I'm like, hey, that's the title of my book. That'll work. Let's do that thing. And, uh, and then the more we explored the concept of it, really what it means is that I want to empower people to be able to tell their story and just strip it down without any of the fancy, right? Like he's like right now I'm right. showing up and I don't have the fancy digital background and the little waves doing, and I'm not going to be telling you to check out this PowerPoint. These are my slides. And this is my, <laughs> like, don't do that. Come on, show up. Right. And, and, and that's what I want people to be able to do to just mm. be authentically themselves, show up, have a good time, have some laughs and, mm -hmm. and tell your story the way that it is without without the need for gimmicks and to be able to strip it down and, and be raw, be real with people, right? Tell the naked truth. So right. there's multiple layers to the, to the title, the one being tell the naked truth. The other one is be able to do it without the gimmicks. And then obviously stop picturing your audience naked and have the power that if you wanted to, and I have been challenged, I have been challenged. People are like, Oh yeah, Mr. Speaker guy, you think you can do it? <laughs> do it without your clothes on. Tyler. Let's see how that goes. And oh, I, wow. I've, I've done it once for charity, but it was hard because they're like, yo, just do it now. I'm like, um, and I'm looking at the promoter and she's going, and I'm like, uh, I, I'm sorry. I won't be able to do that for you today. And they're like, you're a chicken. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just really legally minded. And I don't want to be sued. I don't know how many people in the audience are under 18. So how about we do it again? Cause when I ever, I do an event, we always book an insurance day. Right. Mm. So if it gets rained out or if it gets canceled or COVID, like who knows what. Right. So 
I never know that that date is actually going to go through. So we always book an insurance date. And on this one, we'd happen to book the same venue a week out. And this guy was a heckler. I had an audience that was about 250 people. And this guy was the biggest douche canoe. Like he was just <laughs> on me the whole time. I was like, whatever, I, I've got a thick skin. I've been performing since I was six years old. I have 35 years public speaking experience. So I had no problem just being like, hey, whatever, just ignoring him and addressing him when I needed to. But he's like, take clothes off, Nick and gay. And I was like, okay, here's what I'm going to do for you. I said, if you agree to come back for quadruple the ticket price, because mm. I ain't taking my clothes off for nothing, Tyler gets paid, right? <laughs> Um, I was like, I will donate the entire proceeds to the local food bank because I love supporting the food bank. And, uh, I said, I will do that. Everybody has to agree to come back. We have the space rented anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's mine. I was just going to use it to do some workshop stuff, but this seems a better use of my time. Right. I will come on and I will give you the same 45 minutes that I just gave you now but we're going to put it all to charity and I will do it naked to prove to you that I can. Mm. And they're like, oh, snap. And so I did. It was great. It was awkward as it was cold <laughs> and shit in that theater. I was like, I was like, okay, but we do it. Cause normally I like to have the theater a little bit cold because the, um, the lights are hot mm. and, and the audience, if you have it too warm, like if you have it, what is a normal room temperature, uh, the audience gets sleepy. Right. And they want to drift off to sleep. So I usually have it a little bit cold, like a, you know, keep it just, a, just a tiny bit chilly so that people have to wear a sweater and it keeps them alert. <laughs> and, uh, and so for the second one, I was like, no, 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 we can't do that. <laughs> the temperature, man. I'm already a skinny white guy. I can't have this one go really south on me. And no flash <laughs> photography, folks. No flash uh, photography. That is hilarious, man. Yeah. Uh, so when you deal with people, and we're going to talk about stage fright. But yeah, before we can get to how to get over it, what do you think stage fright comes from when it comes to people? Well, so that's the, here's the thing. Um, people will say, I have stage fright. Mm. And what they think they mean by that is that they're afraid of public speaking. And the reality is they're not. There's right. no, like you and I are having a conversation right now. Mm -hmm. People speak in public daily like you think of it yeah. you walk you get into the subway you're having a conversation with a friend you you even in talking in your car you're walking down the street you're in the office you're on the phone whatever you're you're public right. speaking all the time what people are actually afraid of when they say i have stage fright mm -hmm. is that what they're afraid of public judgment like they're afraid mm. that the thing that they're going to say is going to be taken negatively mm. or misconstrued or that worse they don't even feel that it is going to be taken negatively. They have the mistaken belief that their opinion doesn't matter. That the thing that they're trying to say is inconsequential or they don't have anything important to say. Right. And so they just don't say anything. And that is the fear of public speaking. When people are talking about how they have stage fright, it's usually because they're afraid that they don't know what to say or that they're going to screw it up somehow and they get stuck in their head and right. they start telling this false narrative and this unbelievable bs story to themselves mm. and i can i can obliterate it right now so ready two right. things so i want you to think of the last time you were at some kind of an event or some kind you saw a speaker of any kind right uh whether it was on tv right you're sitting back and you're mindlessly watching Dr. Oz or whatever it is that you happen to be doing the last time you saw a speaker live or on the television and they introduced them and they're like, even right now, right? Mm. You just introduced me. The a great introduction, by the way, I'm, I'm stealing it as man, you nailed it. Right. <laughs> and everybody was like, power to speak naked guy. Oh, I want to know this. Right. I want, I want your audience to think right now when Finch introduced me, how many of you out there were like, well, I hope this guy doesn't have anything to say. I hope he forgets everything <laughs> he wanted to bring. I hope he's sweaty and just gross. I hope he can't think. I hope he freezes up. I hope he forgets what he was going to say. And I hope he just bombs this thing. How many? Be honest and type right. in the comments or whatever. Like, <laughs> let Finch know if that was your actual thought. Because I guarantee you it wasn't. Right. right? And then on top of it, but that's, that's 
the stuff that we're saying in our head. And yet mm. our audience is on board. You show up to an event, right? You and I show up. You and I are going to have this conversation right now. You're thinking to yourself, man, this is going to be awesome. Right. And that's what 90% of your audience is going to be that. There is going to be 10% who are like, oh, I can't believe my girlfriend dragged me to this <laughs> thing again. And this guy is going to be talking naked. I don't want to see no <laughs> naked guy. I don't care if it's going to charity. I don't want to see him naked. Tell him to put clothes on. <sighs> it's only 45 minutes. Okay, we'll watch. I'll do this. We'll do this. <laughs> right? Like, there's that 10% who just don't want to be there. But it has nothing to do with you or what you're saying. They just mm -hmm. don't want to be there. But 90% of the people showed up because they paid good cash dollars. They, right. they they want the information. So your only job is to show up and give them what it was that you said you were going to do. And that and that's not even if you're a professional speaker like me. If you are just in the boardroom and you have to do some kind of weird sales presentation, if you're doing a podcast mm -hmm. and you need to bring your guests on or you're a guest on a podcast or if you have if you're a salesman and you just you need to tell them why this is the best model car that they are ever going to get into like all of those things are public interactions as a public speaking and you have to remember if somebody showed up to your work you're a car dealer or a car salesman and they showed up to your dealership they want a car right right you show up to my seminar my workshop you start watching mm -hmm the off the fence show like you want some information you were here for a reason you tuned in right. and so my the only thing i have to do is come and be me and give you that information so to get over mm. stage fright right right there that's a powerful thing to know that the audience is on your side so mm. all that stuff that's going on in your head that's blah 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 blah, blah it's just a story it's false it's not even real and so stepping into your power and knowing that you are the authority you were you were told to be there for a reason and people showed up for a reason mm -hmm. they're already on your side so mm -hmm. that'll take care of 90 percent of it and then for the other people who are like okay well that's great but they've asked me to say something that i don't want to talk about mm -hmm. right i'm I, it's either something i don't feel comfortable sharing or something i don't want to discuss i'm going to give two big nuggets to your audience right now the thing you're afraid to say is the thing your audience needs to hear. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Whatever, guaranteed. Whatever that thing is, is that that's eating at you and you're like, oh, if they find out about this, they're going to judge me. <laughs> Let them. Because I guarantee, some, no, nobody has a unique story. You have a unique set of circumstances that create that that's unique to you. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you, you pick the story. Right, infidelity, uh, loss of job. You've become broke. Uh, you know, you. And, and there, it doesn't matter what the tragedy or what the triumph that mm -hmm. you've gone through. You know, I made a million dollars. Okay, well, so did half a billion other people. Like, there's a lot of millionaires out there right now. <laughs> right. I made a billion dollars. Okay, well, there's still a couple hundred of you people. So you're not <laughs> unique. Way to go. How did you do it? Right. So our stories themselves, the circumstances that led to that event is probably unique to us. And so we want to know that part of the story. But the, you know, if you, the thing that you think you're struggling with is really not a, a, a big deal. And, mm -hmm. and when you say it, like when somebody comes up and says, you know, my spouse cheated on me. Oh, okay. Now we're on. You tell me why, you know, or better yet, my spouse cheated on me and I forgave them. Mm -hmm. And this is why. And we're stronger now. One of the best talks that I, I ever saw was uh, a, an incredible woman that I've had uh, absolute pleasure to work with on occasion, uh, published author herself, really, really good. And she was afraid to do some public speaking. So we were doing some uh, coach training for her mm -hmm. and her speech was on infidelity. She, she talked about mm -hmm. how she came home one day and, you know, her husband's phone to dinged and uh, she just was handing it to him but the little thing popped up on the screen uh. and it was like i miss you already <laughs> well who the f misses you already because i'm right here mister i'm right here <laughs> and then and then the story came out and so she's telling this auditorium of 300 people this story and everybody's going oh man and then she starts talking about how infidelity is a series of um a uh, breakdown and and poor choices right it starts with one bad choice and then it start, you know, it's an erosion of 
your morals and your values. And, and suddenly you're starting to make compromises that you wouldn't normally make. And you don't really intend to, right? I'm, right. I don't, I'm not going to cheat on my wife. It's just lunch. I'm just going, I'm meeting a friend for lunch. And I, I'm, yeah, I'm flirting with her, but it's not going to go anywhere. I, I want her to feel good. She's wearing a very nice dress and I like her yeah. lips. That's fine, right? And I'll pick up the lunch. I can write it off. It's fine. And yeah, she, you know, we do it a couple of times and now we want to have a dinner together. Why not? It's work dinner. Let's do mm. this, right? And now you start to do it. And now she wants to make me dinner at her place. Why not? Mm. And why can't I have a glass of wine? And you know, when you start making the, like everything in you is going, hey, <laughs> I don't think your wife likes this. But you're justifying it. You're justifying it until the next thing you know, you're having an affair. And so she goes on to explain these series and these sequences. And she said, but you know, I needed to take accountability for my part. Right. Why, where, where was I in that? And she says, I, I want you to understand that I'm not justifying his behavior and I'm not saying that his behavior is my fault, mm -hmm. but where was I, what, where, what was, how was I respond? What were, what was I doing that contributed to the environment that bred this behavior? That's good. And, and so she starts talking about that. And all of a sudden the audience is going, Oh, whoa, 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 wait, Hey, Hey, Missy. We were on board with you when you were a victim, but now that you're taking your strength back, we're a little confused <laughs> and I want to know where this goes. And then she goes, and if you're what, and everybody's wondering, right? They're like, okay. So she talks about the counseling and she, said, and she goes, so if you're wondering what my husband thinks about all of this, about me standing up on stage and spilling out my guts and, and, and airing our dirty laundry in front of 300 people and everybody's going, yeah, we want to know. She's like, all you need to do is ask him. He's sitting right there. Whoa. Mic drop. Mic oh, drop. Oh, man. She did that and everybody went, oh, oh. And then like big claps, right? Because because it showed that what she was saying wasn't BS, mm -hmm. that they were yeah. working on it, that they that they had it. And she brought it around, man. That was the best 12 minute mm. speech I've ever, ever seen in my life. And I'm flawless. But why? Because she exposed it. And, and, and the audience was on her side, right? The biggest thing that she was afraid to talk about was that there was infidelity in her marriage because mm -hmm. on the surface and, and to the public, it looked perfect. And, and yet there was this thing that was gnawing at her. And, and as soon as she exposed it, man, everybody was on her side. And the rush and the flood of people who came to her and asked, well, you know, what can I do about this? How can I get over that? And blah, like it just, it, it skyrocketed her, uh, gave her instant credibility. It created camaraderie within mm -hmm. the room. Like people were on her side. So if she can get up in front of her husband and 300 strangers right. and talk about how he was cheating and how she felt about that and, and her, uh, what led to the circumstances and what they were doing to address it. If she could do that, anybody can do anything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's so fitting that you, you led with that, her story, because when we think about public speaking, I mean, I've been speaking for over 25 years and I remember the first time I got on the stage. Now I've never been the type of person that was, I never had stage fright. I have gotten nervous and it's for a number of those reasons you talk about I'm just, I myself was like, don't forget what you had to say. Let me tell you, let me tell you where that came from, Tyler. It came mm -hmm. from childhood. I was in yes. the eighth grade. Was it eighth grade? Eighth grade. Yep. Eighth grade. And at the end of the school year, we always had this huge talent show where, where all the kids can get a chance to perform if they want to. Myself yes. and the guy that you guys know today is Andre 3000, part of Outcast. It was me, him. Two other guys, we had this little group we performed it, and we got on stage and I forgot what I wanted to say. My This whole route we went over doing lunch <laughs> for weeks, I forgot it on stage because the whole school was there at this time. We was in the gymnasium. And from yeah. that moment on, I had a fear of getting on stage and forgetting what I wanted to say. And that created a uh, apprehension and nervousness but i still wasn't afraid to get up and talk um no. because listen man i can i can substitute stuff because i, I here's the secret i learned nobody knows what you're gonna say anyway <laughs> that's, right. that's right they don't know they don't know and so the only person who knows you're screwing up is you yes especially if it's an unscripted thing like if you're going out and you're doing a play right. or you're doing a song 
right? That that has especially people know the song at that point. Right. Like if it's a new song, you're like, hey, we're just about to we're gonna drop a new beat for you, right? Let's do this thing. We we just we just cut this. We want you to hear it. Well, they don't yeah. know what the lyrics were, so they're never gonna know. But you know, if and that's one of the reasons why in the book I talk about don't get locked to a script because then mm. you can't recover. Like you start going blah, blah, blah. Right. But it's funny that you mentioned that. So you, I, I'm so happy that you're aware of the fact that you are not afraid of public speaking. Mm-hmm. You're afraid of forgetting what to say. Yes. 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 And it's a distinct difference. Mm-hmm. And the great thing is, is there's a lot of things that you can do to get over being afraid mm-hmm. of forgetting what to say. Part of that is don't have a scripted thing. <laughs> Another thing is um, 70% of, of your work, uh, studies have shown, by the way, right. studies, those studies, which studies, I don't know. I didn't source them, but I know that studies <laughs> say that uh, you, 70% of your um, prep time mm. should go into learning your content. Right. And I think a lot of people confuse that with memorizing a script. I will say this exactly yeah. this way in this manner. And this is how I'm going to do it. Because if I say it like this, it will be good. No, stop it. Don't do that know what the flow of the conversation is. Like when I come on to these things, I usually have three to five bullet points of things that I would like to cover, but I don't get locked into them because we start having a good conversation and you're going to start telling me about this story. Yeah. And it reminds me of this story. And I'm like, I did the same thing. <laughs> True. Right? So all you have to do is start the prep work, like making sure that you know your content better than anyone, which is where the power of story is so helpful right. because nobody knows your story better than you. Mm-hmm. So you can tell it and you'll never forget what happened. You just say the things that happened. And if you don't say it the same way, as you pointed out, no one in the audience knows. Nobody and knows. If, if there's somebody like I have people who come to my workshops regularly just to work on things, mm-hmm. right? Because they're really, they, none of my workshops are ever the same. It's, it's structured the same way, but they're always different because we always have a new group of people and we're always exploring new stories. Mm -hmm. So I have people who can come back multiple times to my workshops and I tell the same couple of stories, right? And and the, the, the details never change how Mm -hmm. I get to the details often do, but the deep, the main points of them never change, but they will hear it over and over and Mm -hmm. over again. And they can hear it over again because I never tell it the exact same way because it's not scripted. Dude. And it, and it, one of the stories that I tell is is um, no word of a lie. You teed it up perfect for me. So thank you, Finch. <laughs> I had a similar experience only in the ninth grade instead of the eighth grade. So <laughs> I've been at that point, I had been acting and performing since I was six years old. Mm-hmm. And so at that point, you're what, like 13, 14 years old, right? When yep. you're in the ninth grade. And so uh, we'll, we're going to say I was 14 because it's easier math than the 13. So six to 14, <laughs> we're, we're going to call it eight years. I've been uh-huh. public speaking at that point. And I had done regional speech competitions and, and recited plays and poems and all that fun stuff. And up, we have Remembrance Day in mm-hmm. Canada. It's Memori- or uh, Veterans Day or Memorial Day um, down in the States, November 11th. And every... Every year, I would be asked to read the play in Flanders Fields. Okay. And I'd done it for, at that point, I'd probably been doing it since I was 10 years old, so four or five years. And I mean, Mm -hmm. I had it memorized in Flanders Fields, where the poppies grow among the crosses, row on row. And it would just, you just do it. Right. But this, uh, the, when I was 14, grade nine, we had the assembly and everybody came in and they wheeled in this veteran. Like they'd always have the veterans, right? And they'd always come in and they'd sit down and whatever. And they were always, they always looked like grandpa and they were just, they were soft and squishy and you just wanted to love on them, right? Right, right. But this time they wheeled in this dude and he looked grizzled. Like picture uh, Clint Eastwood if he'd eaten a lemon and you kicked him in the nards. Oh. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that dude looked so he was withered he didn't want to be there he was mean he was chiseled he was lean for mm. and he probably late 80s early 90s and i'll never forget because they wheeled him in in this wheelchair and they put him right at the front obviously mm. and so the podium is right here and he's right here and and i see him get wheeled up And he had this walking cane. He must have used it to get in and out of a car and get into his wheelchair. And I'll never forget that cane. And he, when they introduced me to read the poem, 
I remember him kind of like doing this on the cane and leaning forward and just glaring. And he had these piercing blue eyes. Like, I, I don't know how many people will get the reference, but it was like looking at a white Walker. Okay. Like dude was just, I just, <laughs> tell me what you're going to do. And, and he leans in like this. And at that moment I start thinking to myself, man, this guy has seen it. Mm. Like he was at the war. Like he might've even have been to Flanders fields. He probably lost friends in the war. Like this dude, who am I? I, I haven't, I live a cushy, cushy life. I'm, you know, I, who, who am I to even talk to this man about this? And I had all of the stuff go into my head. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? The words did not come out of my mouth. The stuff went in my head and it evacuated the mouth. And then the mouth went. <laughs> I don't know. And I'll never forget it. My principal, vice principal, Mr. Holloway Chuck kind of is looking at me like. Say the words, Tyler. You can do <laughs> and it. I, was like, uh, I don't know. And because I've been doing it so often, do you think I was prepped with like a cheat sheet or anything? No. Why prep? Why do anything? Why maybe study that material the day before, Tyler? No, because you know it. It's memorized. It's up here. Yeah. yeah. Gray matter will work for you. No, it didn't. <laughs> it no, it not. did not that day. So anyway, he he kind of graciously pulled me aside and said, we'll come back to that. And the old guy was really angry at that point. And then I quickly found a copy of it and was like, yum, 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 and then went in mm -hmm. and read it. Hit it out of the park when I finally could. <laughs> <laughs> but I was I was blank, and it was the first time that mm. I had experienced what the, most people would call stage fright. Oh, in that okay. right, like I got pasty, like oh, every mm. bit of moisture. I might as well have eaten fifteen saltines before I went up there because there was no <laughs> moisture in my mouth and <laughs> spitting stuff everywhere and just pits. Oh yeah, fourteen. I bet you I smelled beautifully after that because man i was sweating something <laughs> fierce and i don't think i'd have discovered the joys of pit stick yet so i was just devastated devastated by it a shaking and all uh, of it like all of the things that people talk about i'm like oh that stage fright that kind yeah and and i didn't experience it again until i was about 17 and and mm -hmm. and and to be able to deconstruct and realize that i it was because of a fear of judgment yeah. a fear of judgment and a lack of preparation caused me to not be able to deliver what I needed to do. If I had been prepared and if I hadn't let the judgment bother me, there would have been no issues. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Now, you talked earlier about authentic voices. And I, I say mm -hmm. this. Are you in Clubhouse, Tyler? No. Do you know why? This is an Android phone. Clubhouse is elitist to all you iPhone folk. And I want it. I want a Clubhouse. <laughs> And uh, I'm probably going to get an iPhone just so that I can come in Clubhouse and hang out. All right. Do you have an iPad? I No, I don't I anything. I Android. <laughs> I'm with an A, not with an I. Follow the bouncing ball here. Finn. Okay. Well, if you was in Clubhouse, I've had these conversations several times about people viewing other people's voices uh, more valuable than their own, which is yeah. why they can revere so many other people like celebrities or notables. And they'd be like, ah, you know, and they come to the clubhouse, they come in, they cram into these rooms only to hear the advice of somebody else. And they feel inferior because they have yet to discover their voice. And I wanted to ask you this because you talk about how people discover their why. And before you tell people how they can discover their why, I want to ask you, how did you discover yours? So it, it's been a long securitist journey. So get ready. You, you got water there, right? I got plenty good, of good, something. Good. I ain't going to tell you what's in this cup, but. Stay hydrated, my friend. Stay <laughs> hydrated. We're about to go on a very long trip. So um, I've, again, been performing since I was six years old. And I eventually got into stunt work. Okay. And stunt work then um, morphed into a safety career. I became mm. a safety consultant. And then because I was really good communicating as a safety consultant, I've now gone back to speaking. Only now it's instead of acting, it's my own content. Mm -hmm. And in the safety training, one of the things that we learn as safety professionals is uh, accident and incident investigation. And as part of that, you're going to look into a root cause. And we do what's called a root cause analysis. And there's a whole bunch of different ways 
to do a root cause analysis. There's this really complex one called tap roots and it, you do the branches of the tree and mm -hmm. come down to what the root cause is. There's uh, other models. There's a Swiss cheese model. So various, um, there's holes in any given uh, system. And if all of the systems line up right, you have a thing. And there's another mm. one called the five whys. Now, mm. I love the five whys. It's very simplistic. You just keep asking why until you get down to the root cause. The problem with it is the name. It says five whys. So how many whys do you ask, Finch? Right. Five. Yeah, it's not five. That's the wrong answer, but that's what's implied in it. It says wow. five. So what you do is you ask why, 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 why until you can't ask why anymore. So what I call it is the McKenzie principle. Mm. And when I have people who are doing the workshops or if they read the book or if they get any of the resources from the website, they, they learn the McKenzie principle. And okay. all it is is a, a fancy application of the five whys, a very specified application of the five whys. And so you ask yourself, why do I do this thing? Mm. Right? What, why is it that I want to do the thing that I'm going to do? For me, public speaking. Why do I do public speaking? Well, because A, I'm good at it. Well, why am I good at it? Well, because I've been acting since I was six years old. 35 years, I better be good at it or I was doing something wrong professionally for a long while. Right. Okay, but why did I do it professionally? Well, I got into theater when I was six years old. Why did I get mm. into theater when I was six years old? Well, it was an outlet for me when my father passed away. Okay. Oh, ah. oh now there's a thing there. Yeah. So why was it an outlet when my father passed away? Well, I needed some creative way for me to express myself because when my father passed mm -hmm. i didn't actually outwardly mourn his passing for almost uh, years so why did i need the outlet well i needed i needed some recognition i needed mm -hmm. some way of living up to a standard of a, of a man who i then didn't get to be around right. and now there's more to that but you start delving into that mm -hmm. deeper why and now fast forward some of the things that um push me for it is the birth of my daughter now i'm responsible for another human life mm. i also see the inequality between a male voice and a female voice and it drives mm. me crazy it's why the majority of my clients are female wow. female entrepreneurs because they usually have the greatest and the best and the brightest ideas and yet they're the ones who are most afraid the society wants to hear from them but they have their own inner demons saying what I have to say or what I have to share is not good enough for whatever reason. The clubhouse effect that you just talked about is a perfect mm -hmm. example of it. Yep. What makes me an authority? And just because Finch introduced me doesn't mean that I know more about public speaking than anybody else. Right. But what I have done is I've figured out how to say it my way. Mm -hmm. Right. I've been on stage with Les Brown. Les Brown is a master. But I've also stood toe to toe with him. Wow. You know, I, he was unable to finish uh, an event that he was doing in Bend, Oregon a few years ago. And the promoter brought me in to, to just kind of deliver content because the show must go on and Les couldn't finish the show. Wow. And am I better than Les Brown? No, no. But uh, is Les Brown better than me though? No. Does he have more experience? Absolutely. He does. Right. But it, his content is just different than my content. That's and true. I, I, I learned this really, really, really valuable tool when I was younger. Uh, a good mentor of mine um, put me, got me into uh, a seminar called The Breakthrough Experience by John Demartini. Okay. And he does this really, really cool exercise where he goes, you know, who is your pedestal? Like, who is the, who is the idol? You know, who is your Michael Jordan? Right? Who is your Wayne Gretzky? What other sports figures do we have? Who is your Tom Brady? Right. Whatever. I don't know. I don't know what your audience is playing these days. I'm a hockey guy myself. Right. Okay. So who is your idol? And what do they what attributes do they have? And you start writing them down. And they're mm. like, when have you in your life been that? Like, what is the good? And when have you done that? And then what are some of the bad things? Like, what have they done? That mm. is maybe not so good. And you know, Brady may or may not have cheated. If, deflating some balls we will never know we'll never have know you, has not been proven has not been proven <laughs> but right like may, maybe we did some stuff that was maybe not ethically right so we're never gonna and, admit it tyler we're never ever. gonna admit it mm -mm. i don't mind admitting it i've screwed up <laughs> more than my fair share and and <laughs> learned lessons wonderfully every time but the point is is that we all 
have these human attributes because we're human. Right. And one person doesn't do anything better than any other. Uh, a, a good friend of mine always mm. likes to say, Beyonce has the same 24 hours that you do. Right. Thanks. And, 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 and yes, some people see more outwardly success than other people do. And, and sometimes that's within your control. And sometimes that isn't within your control. But the, the point is, is that you, when you have these idols who are up here, remember, they're not up here. We are all human. We're all here. We just have different experiences as we go through our life. And my experience in my life is just as important as yours. True. And man, I hope that message resonates mm. today more than ever. Your life is just as important as mine, is as important as everyone else. We all share the planet. We are all human beings. And so when you get into something like a clubhouse, if somebody says a thing and you're like, hey, I have a thought on that. Mm -hmm. Say it, Say especially it. in Clubhouse, right? Because that's how you 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 contribute to the conversation. That's how you grow your following. If you're looking to do that, that's how you find your audience. Is saying the things uh, as I've, I've I say it over and over and over and over again. The thing you're afraid to say is the thing your audience needs to hear. If you're sitting there and you're holding on to that nugget, mm -hmm. uh, why? Why let it out and see who it resonates with? The great thing about doing that is, is, is it has uh, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. When you put that secret, that thing you're afraid to say out into the world, it does two things. It repels mm -hmm. the people that do not resonate with that message, which is wicked. It saves you time. You don't have to weed them out. They weed themselves up for you. And it draws to you like a moth to the flame, the people who need to hear that message, mm -hmm. who want to hear that message. And when you, you can draw people to you by saying the thing that they need to hear and push people away by saying the thing that they don't want to hear, you, you are electric, you are magnetic, and apparently can become the president of the United States. Because <laughs> let, me, let me ask your audience this right now. You don't think I'm right? If I said, make America great again, you just had a visceral gut reaction to that. Uh -huh. It was either positive or negative. It wasn't wishy-washy. You weren't right. like... Eh, whatever. And I don't care which side of the fence you are on that. Right. I don't care. The point is, is that is a message. That is one of the best messages from the 20th century, 21st century, because you want to talk yeah. about messaging and, and targeting and saying something that, um, you know, saying the thing that you're afraid to say because your audience, it will resonate with your audience. Make America great again. And mm. then everything that goes with that statement is proof. That when you say what you, what your audience, what you need to say, what you're afraid to say, your audience will resonate with it. And you're, and the audience that isn't for you will be instantly repelled by it. Right. That's true. Make it work for you. Make it work for you. But right, use so, your powers for good instead of evil, for the love of God. Please, for the love of God. Uh, so, so in, um, a, as we get ready to get out of here, mm -hmm. what would be the one thing you would tell someone who's contemplating public speaking or, I mean, it doesn't even have to be public speaking. I think the things that you teach in, in your book helps people with everyday life. It doesn't really yeah. matter what genre, what, what medium they, they are looking to utilize it in, but it also would help them if they want to be public speakers or, or, you know, teachers, whatever the case may be, because I think some tools that we get from people these are everyday tools. Some tools are gimmicky. They only going to work in one space or another. But I think the power to speak naked goes beyond the proverbial, hey, I'm standing on stage. Let me imagine everybody being naked. No, it, to me. Now, you got to correct me if I'm wrong. Well, you can't correct me because this is my opinion of your book. That's right. I'm thinking when I'm talking, thinking about the power to speak naked, I'm not talking about just me standing on stage. Me being unapologetically myself at all times, um, unorthodox. I can be. I can be uh, witty. I can whatever I am, whatever makes up Finch. I can be that. And when I show up in a space, I can show up being that person because as I'm speaking, I'm unveiling all the layers of me that needs to come out so I can connect with my audience, the people that sit that sitting around, even here on this podcast, I do that every week. You know, I get naked. Okay. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I can showcase the things that people need to know are here to help them scale, climb or clear 
the fence that they're getting off of. So what, what's one more thing you would tell the uh, people who, who might be listening or, or watching this podcast? The one key that I would give to them, and this goes for anything. And as you said, public speaking, I don't need you to be the next Tony mm -hmm. Robbins or the next Brian Tracy or Les Brown. If you are great, man, I would love to be a catalyst on that journey right. and help propel you forward. But I just want you to be more comfortable in your own skin, having the tough conversations with your loved ones, with your spouse, with your kids, with your boss, with your mm. colleagues, employees, whoever it happens to be, empowering you to be able to say the thing that you're afraid to say. And so if I could give one piece of advice, it would be that authenticity is synonymous with self-awareness. Mm. Mm. And I would love for everybody to write that down because once I realized that, that unlocked every door for me because I remember being, you know, starting out this speaker journey and kind of stumbling into it where somebody, uh, I, I, because I was doing the safety, I actually had um, uh, an executive who had seen one of my toolbox talks approach me afterwards and mm. say, Hey, that was really good. Do you, do you, talk and i was like oh yeah of course i'm an actor <laughs> yeah and he was like great would you would you give a keynote at our next agm about this i really would like you to talk about that and i went yeah sure why not and he was like you know uh how much will it cost and i was like i don't know and i just kind of threw out a number and he said yes and i went i can't believe they're gonna pay me that <laughs> um but when i first started out when people would ask what do you talk about i would say mm -hmm. oh anything what do you want me to talk about? I'm a trained actor. I, I'm your pitch man. What do you want? You tell me. You tell me. Uh -huh. And I was trying to be somebody I wasn't. Mm. And I was trying to fit into every mold. I, I, you know, I didn't care. I didn't care what shape your hole was. I was that shape peg, right? No, I'm not. I am a round peg. And there are square <laughs> holes, triangle holes, and there are octagonal holes. And I'm a round peg. And I got to quit trying to be square. I'm round live with it. And as soon as I realized that I needed to embrace who I was mm -hmm. and stop saying I can do anything and get really niche really quick and say, look, you know, I'm going to, my target audience, female entrepreneurs, preferably those who are starting up charities. Like that's kind of my, where I, my wheelhouse, where I have the most social impact. It's where I enjoy doing the work the most. Mm -hmm. And so that's where my focus goes. But can other people work with me? Absolutely. If I have the ability to empower a charity director who is trying to do social good for um, people who can't read, you know, I've, I've worked with a, co a company called Literacy for Life, or if I can help um, people like Made by Mama, mm -hmm. who uh, I do really good social work and catch the people who don't fit the nice pegs of mm. social assistance and fall through that net. You know, if I can, it can help somebody like a DD Loveridge who mm -hmm. is, does amazing work with um, uh, women who have experienced infancy and pregnancy loss. Oh, wow. Right. Like those are some powerful people. Yes. Right. I, I'm just, I'm just a, a charismatic dude who used to be an actor for a while. I don't do any social good. But if <laughs> I can, if I can empower those people to be able to spread their message, that's important. That, yeah. that has meaning and that, that gives my life meaning. So, in order for me to do that, I had to embrace who I was mm -hmm. and I have to empower them to embrace who they are. Right. Don't try to be the be all and catch all social mm -hmm. net for everything. No focus on what matters to you. And the, so we drill into the why, why is it important for you to have this charity? Why is it important for you to have this mm -hmm. message? What is it that you're afraid to say? And how can that be powerful to the people who need to hear it? I worked with a really, really mm. amazing speaker, Charlene, who had overcome serious mental health issues and had uh, attempted to take her own life. Wow. And we got her to stand up and, and start talking about her message about mm. where she got to her darkest point and what pulled her out of it. And it was actually hearing somebody else talk about their struggle with right. suicide that empowered her to then talk about her struggle with suicide. And the number of people that she saved is countless. But it's a hard thing to talk about. So why is it important to her? So we connect the why. And then we find we don't try to sugarcoat it. We don't try to make you the next somebody. We try to make you the first you. Yes, that part. Embrace who you are. And that's where the power is. So if, again, if I could leave them with one thing, 
Authenticity is synonymous with self-awareness. If you don't know who you are at your core, you can't, never mind public speaking, you are going to be walked over in every, you will compromise yes. all areas of your life until you can know what your root value is, what your core values are, and what your belief structure is to your being. And then we can, then we can work forward until, until we can nail that down. You, right. I can't help you in any way. And I don't know that anybody else can either. That's true. That's true. Hey man, I have enjoyed talking with you and I, I want to say before we get out of here, uh, if people want to connect with you, which I'm sure they're going to want to, how can they do so online? <laughs> Easiest way to do it. Go to Sean Tyler Foley.com. I spell it the proper Irish way. S E A N. <laughs> T-Y-L-E-R-F-O-L-E-Y, SeanTylerFoley.com. And any of your listeners who are listening right now, if they're listening or they're watching, if you click up on the upper right side, we've got a thing called The Method. It's an 11-page um, download. It's free for you. Five insider tips that I've um, compressed from 35 years of experience to help mm. you overcome stage fright, uh, memorize, and, and be comfortable with your, your messaging. And, uh, and just get up on stage and feel more confident and more comfortable. It's free for everybody to get. So please take advantage of it. I, and I'm happy to connect with anybody who comes through and, and see what I can do to help. Okay. And your book, The Power of the Speak Naked, is available right now. Where? Power to Speak Naked. So this uh, version of it, don't go and buy it. Don't go and buy it. It's 27 bucks. But um, I got picked up by a publisher, and they're launching it September 7th. What oh. I would love for you to do is go to barnesandnoble.com or your local bookstore and ask them if you can pre-order The Power to Speak Naked. Please, if there was one thing you could do for me, I'm going to give you the free download. Mm -hmm. You go to your store, pre-order a copy, save yourself 10 bucks because when my publisher prints it, it's now going to be $17 because my publisher loves you. <laughs> and uh, so if you pre-order them, they're going to be $17 versus getting it from when I put it out uh, as a self-published book at 27 bucks. So pre-order yourself one. Barnesandnoble.com is always the good one to go to. But hey, support your local bookstore, right? They're mm -hmm. struggling. I'll go out, get there, ask them to pre-order a copy. And uh, anybody who hears this and they, they message me uh, that says that they've bought a copy and they send me a receipt, um, I'm putting them in for a draw for some pretty cool stuff. So feel free to uh, add up to the website. Man, that's good. Tyler Foley, ladies and gentlemen. We have now gotten him off the fence, and he has helped you guys scale, climb, and clear your fence as it relates to you being naked and just being yourself. <laughs> I, I, I love it. Spread the word by leaving a rating and review on iTunes. Thanks for joining us where it always feels good.